On the 8th of October in the year 1904, a young man came to the north wall of the city of Dublin to take the boat for Liverpool. He was James Joyce, age 22. He was on his way to Switzerland to become a teacher of English. James Joyce saw himself as a voluntary exile, expelled from Dublin city because he refused to respect the authority of its guardians, the priests of the Roman Catholic Church, the functionaries of the imperial British state, and extremists of the Irish National Revival. He was joyful as the boat moved out into the bay. Rather than compromise his honesty, he would go to the continent, and there, in silence, secrecy, and cunning, forge a new conscience for the Irish race. I am not despondent. I shall try myself against the powers of the world. And though I seem to have been driven out of my country here as a misbeliever, I have found no man yet with a faith like mine. James Joyce was not travelling alone. Waiting for him on the boat was a young woman from Galway, who had consented to share the lot of the young man she had known for less than four months. There were difficult years ahead for them, but eventually, like thousands of others all over the world, they would look back on this night as the beginning of a journey, during which James Joyce, with Nora beside him, would change the course of modern literature and preserve imperishable the city which was slipping into the distance behind them. Once upon a time, and a very good time it was, there was a moo cow coming down along the road. And this moo cow that was coming down along the road met a nice little boy named Baby Tucku. James Augustine Joyce remembered everything. He could recall stories he'd heard from his earliest years in the house where he was born. 41 Brighton Square West, in the comfortable Dublin suburb of Rathgar. His father told him that story. His father looked at him through a glass. He had a hairy face. His father, John Joyce, worked in the rate collector's office. He had inherited a good deal of property. He lavished affection on his eldest son, James. His mother had a nicer smell than his father. She played on the piano. May Joyce was well-mannered and self-sacrificing. The house in Rathgar was warm and happy, with laughter and a great deal of singing. James remembered everything. When you wet the bed, first it is warm, then it gets cold. His mother put on the oil sheet that had the queer smell. Five years after James was born, 
the Joyce family moved to the fashionable seaside town of Bray. On number one Martello Terrace, John Joyce could indulge his love of boating. James never forgot the laughter, the songs, the stories that filled the house by the sea. Nor Eileen Vance, the little Protestant girl who lived nearby at number four. Eileen had long, thin, cool, white hands because she was a girl. They were like ivory, only soft. Tower of ivory, house of gold. By thinking of things, you could understand them. Soon, James had brothers and sisters, lots of them. And then the family was on the move again. They would move again and again away from Eileen and her ivory hands. While the family had money, James was sent to Tonga's Wood College, a Jesuit school some 20 miles from Dublin. John Joyce was gratified to see his son among the elite of Irish Catholic society. Nothing but the best was good enough for his gym, and the Jesuits were the best. Clongos was the Eton of Catholic Ireland. Joyce was unusually young, only six and a half years of age, when he entered Clongos. He was known as Half Past Six. To his own family, he had always been Sonny Jim. Because of his age and his cheerfulness, he became a great favourite with the school, and he was very happy there. His Jesuit teachers, with their severity and kindness, fascinated him. They taught him, as he would say long afterwards, how to order and to judge. But there were awkward moments for young Joyce. One of his fellow students, Nasty Roach, asked unpleasant questions. What is your father? A gentleman. Is he a magistrate? Nasty Roach was a stink. Roddy Kickham was not like that. Roddy Kickham was a decent fellow. He would be captain of the third line. Joyce was good at his studies, but did not aspire to be a model schoolboy. He was punished three times for minor infractions within a few months of entering Clongos. He forgot his books. He wore muddy boots. And worst of all, he used vulgar language. The Tongo's punishment book records Joyce's first encounter with censorship. Joyce disliked rugby as too rough, but he enjoyed other sports, such as swimming. But most of all, he liked the sunny afternoons on the cricket field. In the soft, grey silence, he could hear the bump of the balls. And from here and from there, through the quiet air, the sound of the cricket bats. Pick, pack, pock, pock. But Clongos was an expensive school and his father was not a magistrate. After three years, his father could no longer afford the fees and had to withdraw James. A debt of 25 pounds still stands on the college books. Joyce returned to a household that was riven by politics. The fall of Charles Stuart Parnell was the principal political event of James Joyce's childhood. Parnell had been the idol of the Irish people, the man who would win home rule for Ireland. But he fell from his position as leader when a divorce suit revealed that he had been living with Kitty O'Shea, the wife of a political colleague. Joyce's father was for Parnell, but Mrs. Dante Conway, the children's governess, was against him. She followed the lead of the Catholic clergy and demanded that the Irish people reject the Protestant adulterer. Joyce described a family row that took place here, at number one Martello Terrace. The Christmas dinner echoed the bitterness of a divided country. 
Right, right. They were always right. God and morality and religion come first. Very well, then. If it comes to that, no God for Ireland. Blasphemer. Devil. We won. We crushed him to death. <laughs> Poor Parnell. My dead king. Within a year of the crisis, Parnell was dead. A year later, John Joyce lost his job in the rates office. John Joyce believed that the two events were related, that he was a victim of the same people who had dragged his hero down. Time and time again, young James heard his father tell the story of the fall. How repeatedly throughout their history, the mean-minded Catholic clergy and the ignorant Irish people had betrayed their great men. At the age of nine, he wrote a poem on the betrayal of Parnell. His father liked it so much, he had it privately printed. Remember it? Why shouldn't I remember it? Didn't I pay for the printing of it? And didn't I send a copy to the Pope? No copy survives. Not even in the Vatican Library. Joyce at this time was very much his father's son. Now and afterwards, he was quite willing to overlook his faults. I was very fond of him always, being a sinner myself, and even liked his faults. Hundreds of pages and scores of characters in my books came from him. To us, he was Uncle Jack, and we heard a lot about him. But uh, I thought he was a bit of a bamboost, if that's what you like to call it. He was, came from a very uh, county, in, county people in Cork, and he very much let that be known. I think he was slightly, um, I don't know what it was, slightly, uh, felt himself slightly superior to the whole lot of us. John Joyce had inherited a substantial fortune and soon acquired the ability to squander it. As his wife brought a long line of children into the world, he mortgaged their fortune out of existence. When he lost his job at the age of 42, he had to manage with 10 children on a pension of 130 pounds a year. Pursued by landlords and creditors, he took his growing family with their few possessions from house to house. James Joyce saw clearly what was happening and observed it with detachment as well as mortification. He was beginning to develop that eye for sordid actuality which would distinguish him as an artist. The dark, muddy lanes behind the houses where we ran the gauntlet of the rough tribes from the cottages to the back doors of the dark, dripping gardens where odors arose from the ash pits. Most of his children came to dislike John Joyce as an improvident, drunken father. But between him and James, the bond of love remained intact, as his sister Eileen remembered. From boyhood, he gave him everything, absolutely everything. Deprived the rest of the family to give it to Jim. He saw in him a genius, and he gave it to him. From the refined splendour of his school at Tongos, James came down to the turmoil of working-class Dublin. For a year and a half, he either did not attend school at all or attended a Christian brother's school which he chose not to remember. Christian brothers be damned. This is with Paddy Stink and Mickey Mud. No, let him stick to the Jesuits in God's name since he began with them. They'll be of service to him in after years. Those are the fellows that can get you a position. Even as the unemployed father of a hungry family, 
John Joyce had enough connections left to arrange for his sons to attend the Jesuit day school, Belvedere College, free of charge. At Belvedere, James continued to shine as he had done at Tongo's. He specialized in modern languages, English, French and Italian, and regularly won prizes. He was made a house captain and a prefect of the sodality of the Blessed Virgin Mary. His growing confidence and independence emerged when he used his part in a school play to impersonate the rector of Belvedere, much to the delight of his audience. The Jesuits were watching him carefully. In a college like this, there is one boy, or perhaps two or three boys, whom God calls to the religious life. Such a boy is marked off from his companions by his piety, by the good example he shows to others. And you have been such a boy in this college. But the Jesuits were too late. Two years earlier, at the age of 14, Joyce had been walking home along the canal one night when he met a prostitute, and he had his first full sexual experience. Good night, Willie, dear. He closed his eyes, surrendering himself to her, body and mind, conscious of nothing in the world but the dark pressure of her softly parting lips. And between them he felt an unknown and timid pressure, darker than the swoon of sin, softer than sound or odor. His first reaction was one of self-disgust, and he sought refuge in religious comfort. In a burst of guilt, he went to confession and promised to live in purity and obedience to the church. But his reformation was not to last. Sexual sin had given him a taste of freedom, a desire to break out of the repressive life around him. He had to choose between the Catholic Church and the directions of his own mind and body. He chose rebellion. He would be different. He would be free. He would be himself. At University College, Joyce was still under the Jesuits, but now made no effort to conceal his break with the Catholic Church. He gained a reputation as a free thinker, brilliant but reckless. He was one of the better speakers at the Literary and Historical Debating Society, which he and his brother, Stanislaus, attended every Saturday night. But it was in the National Library and the office of the librarian, T.W. Lister, that Joyce began to make his name known in Dublin intellectual life, astounding people with the extent of his reading and the arrogant lucidity of his arguments. A fellow student and close friend was Constantine Kern, he recalled those days. He talked a great deal, of, in a sense, he talked a great deal about books, but not in the way that students do. He talked much more about aesthetics, about the principles of aesthetics. His, his, his uh, talk about books was always by way of illusion. Very flattering illusions, of course, because he assumed that you had read all that he had read, and uh, perhaps one concealed one's ignorance for the time being, and then uh, looked up the book in the National Library or elsewhere. Shortly after the fall of Parnell, Ireland discovered a new excitement, cultural nationalism. The Gaelic League wanted a new Ireland based on traditional Gaelic culture and involving the restoration of the Gaelic language. Joyce knew himself to be an Irish writer, but was dubious of their zeal. He took a few lessons from Porrick Pierce, then disassociated himself. When the soul of a man is born in this country, there are nets flung at it to hold it back from flight. You talk to me of nationality, language, religion. I shall try to fly by those nets. He observed with some contempt the effort of Yeats and Lady Gregory and others to start up a new Irish school of drama based upon Irish legend and folklore 
and concentrating especially on peasant life. Joyce was convinced that what Ireland needed was to become aware of intellectual currents in other countries. Life we must accept as we see it before our eyes. Man and woman as we meet them in the real world, not as we understand them in the world of fairy. For Joyce, the dramatist of the real world was the Norwegian, Heinrich Ibsen, whose plays explored life as it was, and not as others would wish it to be. Joyce championed Ibsen and other modern European dramatists. When the National Theatre insisted on Irish peasant plays, Joyce issued a pamphlet in which he accused Yeats of deferring to the taste of the most belated race in Europe. The world of the Abbey play was not the world as Joyce knew it. In 1902, Joyce graduated. He proposed to become neither lawyer, nor teacher, nor clerk. He thought for a time of becoming a doctor as well as a writer. He decided to take a medical course in Paris, supporting himself by reviewing books in English. There was plenty of literary atmosphere in Paris, but food, heat and money were scarce. Despite his poverty, Joyce reported by postcard to his friends that he was attending theatres, cafes and visiting brothels. On Good Friday, 1903, a telegram came from Dublin. Mother dying. Come home. Father. His first exile was suddenly at an end. He came home for his mother's death. As May Joyce died of cancer, she prayed aloud that James and Stanislaus would return to the Catholic Church. In this, as in so much, she was disappointed. My mind rejects the whole present social order and Christianity. My mother was slowly killed, I think, by my father's ill-treatment, by years of trouble, and by my cynical frankness of conduct. When I looked at her face as she lay in her coffin, a face grey and wasted with cancer, I understood that I was looking on the face of a victim and I cursed the system which made her a victim. Joyce spoke of Dublin as the seventh city of Christendom. It was the second city of the British Isles and the focal center of Irish culture, commerce and administration. It retained with all its metropolitan air and its population of 300,000 something of the atmosphere of a small town. People tended to know each other and to know about each other. No serious writer, as Joyce noted, had ever yet presented Dublin to the world. He believed that he was in a position to do this for the first time, as his brother Stanislaus observed. He always held that he was lucky to have been born in a city that is old and historic enough to be considered a representative European capital, and small enough to be viewed as a whole. And he believed that circumstances of birth, talent, and character had made him its interpreter. Joyce's first efforts at a modern Irish prose fiction appeared in the Irish homestead, the stories he was later to call Dubliners. Set in the drab parts of the city which Joyce knew so intimately, the stories portrayed people who were victims, brutalized and repressed. Three stories were published, but readers of the Irish homestead complained, and Joyce was requested 
to submit no more. He regarded this as yet another effort to silence him, and his reaction was to circulate the Holy Office, a verse lampoon which contrasted his own artistic honesty with the intellectual cowardice of his contemporaries. All these men of whom I speak make me the sewer of their clique, that they may dream their dreamy dreams. I carry off their filthy streams. Depressed at the disintegration of his home and the apparent hopelessness of his own prospects, Joyce found some relief in the company of Oliver St. John Gowarty, a medical student with a reputation for high jinks and low verse. Together they drank heavily and sampled the delights of the Kipps, the red light district of Dublin. Stanislaus, ever sober and serious, was disgusted to see his brother fall among medical students, but he never lost faith in him. Jim is a genius of character. He has extraordinary moral courage. Few people will love him, I think, in spite of his genius. One person would love him, and she would love him in spite of his genius. She was Nora Barnacle. One June day in 1904, Joyce noticed an attractive girl sauntering along Nassau Street. He spoke to her. Noting his blue eyes and his cap, she thought he was a foreign sailor and allowed her conversation to develop. Nora Barnacle was lonely, having run away from her home in Galway to escape a brutal uncle. Joyce and Nora made a date. She did not keep it. What could this strange, well-spoken young man see in a simple, uneducated country girl like her? It was a question many others would ask, but not Joyce. He turned up, waited and waited, and then went home and wrote. I may be blind. I looked for a long time at a head of reddish-brown hair and decided it was not yours. I went home quite dejected. Another date was made, and this one was kept. Together, they went walking through Dublin. They fell in love. And Joyce always looked back on that day, June the 16th, 1904, as the most important day of his life. And being the most important day of his life, he made it the most important day in the calendar of modern literature. Joyce had the events of his masterpiece, Ulysses, take place in Dublin on June the 16th, 1904. And ever since, it has become a feast day, Bloom's Day, after Leopold Bloom, the hero of Ulysses, and as such is observed with Joycean celebration and pilgrimage. Nora, Joyce discovered the love that had been missing from his life. It made a great contrast to his family situation, which since his mother's death had further deteriorated. Gogarty saw how difficult the Joyce children found it to survive with only their wayward father to look after them. Once I was in Joyce's home in Cabra Road, St. Peter's Road, Cabra. And it was miserable. The banisters were broken, and the backyard was all, the grass was all blackened out by, there was laundry there and a few chickens. And it was a, a very, very miserable home. He spent most of his time in the National Library. I think he went home rather reluctantly. Gogarty invited Joyce to join him in his extraordinary lodgings in the Martello Tower at Sandy Cove. It would become one of the strangest settings in fiction. 
It is here we find Stephen Dedalus and Buck Mulligan, portraits of Joyce and Gogarty, in the opening chapter of Ulysses. Joyce and Gogarty soon quarreled, and Joyce left the tower abruptly. It was time to get out, not only out of the tower, but out of Ireland. He had tried to live and work there, but had found no place for his rebellious talent. Only in Nora had he found the love and trust he craved. Once she agreed to go with him, he decided to accept a teaching position in Switzerland. He would go into exile, and there he would write books which would contain the moral history of the people who had driven him away. Amen. So be it. I go to encounter for the millionth time the reality of experience and to forge in the smithy of my soul the uncreated conscience of my race. The journey into exile was no honeymoon for the young lovers. Joyce had to borrow money in London and Paris to continue the journey to Zurich. When they arrived in Zurich, there was no vacancy. They should try Trieste on the Adriatic coast. No jobs there either. Then further south to Poland where Joyce found employment for a while. They were soon on the move again. This time, they were lucky. The Berlitz School in Trieste now needed a teacher of English. Trieste, where Joyce and Nora were to spend the next ten years, was at that time one of the most important ports in southern Europe. Joyce warmed to it immediately. I think having got there, he found the atmosphere congenial. There were several things that must appeal to him. Um, for a start, it was a cosmopolitan city. Um, it was a city of many languages, majority perhaps Italians, certainly a very large con contingent of Germans from Austria, of Slavs from um, the part of Slovenia, which was then in the Austrian Empire, of Hungarians, of Jews, of Greeks, etc. In other words, it was a very prosperous seaport and has the cosmopolitan atmosphere of a very large seaport at the time. Also, from a cultural point of view, there was an opera theater, which there still is, and it's a very good one. There were theaters, there were plays and so on, which um, gave a certain cultural atmosphere that uh, he must have appreciated. At the Berlitz School, Joyce's teaching methods were unusual, but successful. One of his pupils remembers. The, these lessons were very funny because we spoke a little of literature, very little of English language, and discussed very much politics. <laughs> Joyce taught Triestine pupils English by lecturing them on Irish history. The subject was predictable. He spoke very much of a, a, a man of whom I don't remember, Parsnell, I think. Parsnell. Yes, and he said also in his books that they were quarreled in his family about this Parsnell because one part of the family was for him and the other part was against him. But I think he would have the, the great hope that Ireland would be one day a free country. There were more immediate problems to be solved. Joyce was incapable of living within his means. He was happy to borrow today and promise to pay tomorrow. In a way, it suited him that Nora had few domestic skills. It was an excuse to take her out nightly to cafes. It was very hard, but it, it was a little his fault because he didn't know the value of money, you know, because he was gaining at the Berlitz School and also in private lessons. But he went uh, again in Trieste, uh, about Trieste, and in the uh, bars, and uh, took wine with the workers because he wanted to know the real character of the Triestines. And then, also in his house, there was not a great order. Nora was lost in this strange new world, baffled by the languages which Joyce mastered so easily. 
Depressed by pregnancy, poverty and the hot weather, she spent melancholy days in bed. Landladies used her pregnancy as justification for ridding themselves of these unreliable foreigners. When Nora went into labour, Joyce thought it was indigestion and was surprised at the arrival of his son, Giorgio. Joyce had not travelled across Europe to become a teacher of English. He was in Trieste to write, but it was not easy to write in a tiny flat with a wife complaining, a baby crying, and debt collectors beating at the door. Oh, vague something behind everything. For the love of the Lord Christ, change my course of God's state of affairs. Give me, for Christ's sake, a pen and an ink bottle and some peace of mind, and then, by the crucified Jesus, if I don't sharpen that pen and dip it into fermented ink and write tiny little sentences about the people that betrayed me, send me to hell. Joyce was recreating in Trieste the domestic anarchy he had escaped from in Dublin. Yet he never lost sight of his artistic mission. And with that genius for survival which characterized all his carelessness, he saw the solution. He would get his brother Stanislaus, solid, sober Stanislaus, to fill a vacancy which had occurred at the Berlitz school. Stanislaus, summoned across the continent by his brother, was scandalized by the squalor and depression. He immediately took upon himself the role of his brother's keeper. My brother's keeper? Uh, well, he saw himself as having been his brother's keeper in the period between 1904, when they um, arrived in Trieste, to the First World War. And he saw correctly that that was the formative period in uh, my uncle's artistic career, which is after all the years when uh, Portrait of the Artist was written, and the beginning of Ulysses, and certainly Dubliners. Um, and he felt that he had to act as a guardian in order to protect this great talent from uh, his own personality and his own, perhaps, self-destruction. Joyce continued to write, driven by his own compulsion, encouraged, bullied, and sometimes even beaten by Stanislaus. Yes, he had no doubts about his genius and he had no doubts about his personality. Um, the fact that he drank too much, for instance, was quite obvious to him. The fact that in many ways he behave irresponsibly was also quite obvious to him. I think, in a way, that didn't matter so long as he could write good books. And so long as he kept on writing good books, then uh, my father was willing to, to support him, was willing to take all, you know, the aggro that went with it, um, and generally stick by him. Uncle Stanley was very careful about money, and he always had it. Always, Stanley always had it, and I, I always remember my uncle standing with gloves and the whole get up, you know. Uncle, uncle Jim was careless about money, and he didn't care a hang whether he had it or not, and he, he would spend it as quickly as he had it. Joyce was struggling to have his stories published. A London publisher agreed to publish Dubliners, then got cold feet. Joyce conducted a long and fruitless correspondence in a heroic defense of his text. The publisher was unmoved and returned the manuscript. This was the last straw. Joyce decided that it was time to move. He snatched at an opportunity to become a bank clerk in Rome. Leaving Stanislaus in Trieste, Joyce with Nora and Giorgio went there in July 1906 eager to see what the Eternal City and he might make of each other. In Rome, Joyce was employed by this bank. He had to write 200 letters a day and look respectable. Before long, Joyce wished himself out of the Eternal City. 25th of September, 1906. Yesterday, I went to see the Forum. I sat down on a stone bench overlooking the ruins. It was hot and sunny. Carriages full of tourists, postcard sellers, medal sellers, photograph sellers. I was so moved that I almost fell asleep and had to rise brusquely. I looked at the stone bench ruefully, 
but it was too hard, and the grass near the Colosseum was too far. So I went home sadly. Rome reminds me of a man who lives by exhibiting to travelers his grandmother's corpse. Unable to make progress with his own novel, Joyce was casting a critical eye over the work of his contemporaries. He was disgusted at what he saw as their failure to come to grips with contemporary life. Henry James ought to get a running kick in the arse for writing his tea slop about Italy. The novelists he read were like the tourists in Rome, paying more attention to the empty forms of the past than to the life of the living city. The more he read of others, the more he believed that he was right to persevere with his own stories of life in Dublin. Dublin was never far from his mind. September 25th, 1906. Sometimes, thinking of Ireland, it seems to me that I have been unnecessarily harsh. I have reproduced, in Dubliners at least, none of the attractions of the city, for I have never felt at my ease in any city since I left it, except in Paris. November 1906. I wish someone was here to talk to me about Dublin. I forget half the things I wanted to do. In this mood, Joyce began a new story, which opens in the house beside the Liffey where his aunts used to hold lavish parties at Christmas time. The central character, Gabriel Conroy, is somewhat like Joyce himself. Gabriel prefers an international culture and is inclined to be snobbish towards Irish parochialism. His wife is from the West, like Nora Barnacle, and he is rather embarrassed by her country origins. Back in the Gresham Hotel, Gabriel wants to make love, but Greta's mind is miles away. She is remembering Michael Fury, a young country boy who loved her wildly and who died when she left him and went to Dublin. The story of Michael Fury leads Gabriel to realize how thin his own emotional life is when contrasted with the rich passion his wife had known in Galway. Yes, the newspapers were right. Snow was general all over Ireland. It was falling on every part of the dark central plain, on the treeless hills, falling softly upon the Bog of Allen, and further westwards, softly falling into the dark, mutinous Shannon waves. It was falling, too, upon every part of the lonely churchyard on the hill where Michael Fury lay buried. It lay thickly drifted on the crooked crosses and headstones, on the spears of the little gate, on the barren thorns. His soul swooned slowly as he heard the snow falling faintly through the universe, and faintly falling, like the descent of their last end, upon all the living and the dead. The Dead is Joyce's first masterpiece, and reflects both his maturity as a writer and his new generosity of feeling for his wife and for Ireland. As Gabriel Conroy looks westward through the snow across Ireland, Joyce looks westward across Europe to Ireland. He was no longer the angry young man who had left Dublin in 1904. He was now the father of two children, the second of whom, Lucia, had been born in the pauper ward in Trieste. Joyce decided to rewrite his autobiographical novel. Accordingly, he took the incomplete version of Stephen Hero and distilled the 63 chapters into a sequence of five movements, each dealing with an important stage in the evolution of the artist. Each chapter is written in a style to suit the material, from the baby talk of the opening to the intellectual disputations of the final chapter. Stephen, as he prepares to leave his own country, sees his vision of beauty on Dolly Mount's strand. She is neither all soul like the Virgin Mary, nor all body like the prostitute. A girl stood before him in midstream, alone and still, gazing out to sea. She seemed like one whom magic had changed into the likeness of a strange and beautiful seabird. Partly to gather material for his writing and partly to gratify his nostalgia, 
Joyce made three trips back to Dublin from his self-imposed exile in Trieste. His first visit in 1909 was followed by an attempt to set up the first cinema in Ireland, the Volta Theatre. It was a splendid idea, but it failed. He had hopes that the Dublin firm of Monsell and Company would publish Dubliners, but eventually they were afraid to touch what they considered dangerous material. He believed that the Dublin publisher, Monsell and Co., George Roberts, he was, uh, was bringing out his uh, Dubliners, and he wanted to go back to Trieste with his new book under his arm, and uh, instead of that, Roberts informed him that he had burned all the proofs and wasn't going to bring out the book. Uh, I just managed to get a copy, or perhaps the proofs, and I remember so well standing in Westmoreland Street and Joyce helpless and hopeless, not knowing where to go or what to turn to. He, was, he, he had been thrown out of Dublin, as it were, and that, I think, was the reason why he never went back to Dublin. Joyce had had enough of Dublin and would never return. His farewell was a broadside, supposed to be spoken by the printer who had burned, or so Joyce preferred to believe, the sheets of Dubliners. Shite and onions do you think I'll print? The name of the Wellington Monument, Sydney Parade and Sandy Mount Tram, Downs' Cake Shop and Williams' Jam. I'm damned if I do. I'm damned to blazes. After his return to Trieste, Joyce was to be rescued by an unexpected source. His rescuer was Ezra Pound, an American poet and admirer of W.B. Yeats. One day, a letter arrived from Pound offering help. Joyce sent him Dubliners, and the first section of a portrait of the artist. Pound knew he was on to something, and set about launching Joyce. He arranged for a portrait of the artist to appear in serial form in the London magazine, The Egoist. Joyce was especially delighted when the first section appeared on February the 2nd, 1914, his 32nd birthday. Four months later, Grant Richards published Dubliners, and there was no legal reaction. Joyce had broken through. On a wave of creative energy, Joyce wrote his only play, Exiles. It deals with betrayal, a theme he would return to in his later work. But 1914 was memorable for other reasons. Austria declared war on Serbia, and soon all Europe was embroiled in death and destruction. Stanislaus, an outspoken critic of Austria, was interned for the duration of the war. Um, he was interned simply because he was a British subject at the time. He had been openly critical of the Austrian government. That seemed to be his habit. So while my uncle and his family were allowed to move to Zurich, he was interned in a place called Katzenau, which is in uh, Niederösterreich, uh, sort of northeast of Vienna. And he stayed there from 1915 till the end of the war, 1919, in fact, when he was, uh, he was liberated. James had too much on his mind to risk involvement in a mere world war. He needed peace and wished to write. And in June 1915, he and his family moved to Zurich in neutral Switzerland. Even there, however, the old problem followed him. How to find the money to live on. He could give English lessons but that would use up the time and energy he needed to devote to his new book. His luck held. Things began to go his way. Thanks to Pound and Yates, he received two grants from the British government and waiting in the wings was a woman who would do more than anybody else to enable him to write, Harriet Shaw Weaver. 
Now he could get down to the novel which had been gathering in his brain. It was to be the most ambitious work he had ever attempted. It would deal with a single Dublin day, June the 16th, 1904. This would be a radically new kind of novel, a modern epic, which would contain the complexity of urban life in the 20th century and would bear the ancient title of Ulysses. James Joyce's Ulysses is a modern epic based not on the glorious deeds of warriors but on the ordinary doings of the people of Dublin as they go about their business one summer's day, Thursday the 16th of June, 1904. It begins at 8 o'clock in the morning in the Martello Tower where Stephen Dedalus is eating breakfast with Buck Mulligan and proceeds to describe with extraordinary detail the actions and interactions of hundreds of Dubliners throughout the day. But if the setting is local, the themes are universal. Here is the world in which we live, thoughts that occupy us, the substance of ordinary life. The hero of the book is a friendly man who feeds the cat, brings his wife breakfast in bed, tries to make a living, and contemplates the sights and sounds of Dublin. Only in one external detail is he unusual. Leopold Bloom is a Jew, though not a practicing one. Mr. Bloom is neither a philosopher nor a fool, a saint or a villain. He is an ordinary man, son, father, husband, would-be lover, a friend. Mr. Bloom is an extraordinary creation because through Bloom, Joyce explores the amazing richness of human life. Never before in literature had the complex individuality of man been revealed with such conviction. To realize his conception of Ulysses, Joyce needed to be assured of time to work and money to live on. Unknown to him, Harriet Weaver had come to this conclusion herself, and she began to send him money anonymously. A relative of mine had left me some money, and that I really didn't need it. I made it over to Mr. Joyce to be a help to him, and uh, he's no financier, and he greatly exaggerated the amount. He didn't understand at all. Harriet Weaver always seemed to be ladylike and proper. She was, however, intellectually, one of the most daring women of her day. A feminist, a political radical, and a champion of the avant-garde in literature. She had been involved with the publication of a portrait of the artist in the Egoist. Well, I think she saw in him or rather in Stephen, I think, initially, because she hadn't met him, the, um, the personification of all the ideals that she, she, she stood for. Liberation from um, institutional religion, liberation from um, sexual um, conventions and so on. And these were all embodied in the portrait, of course. And I think it was the portrait that um, won her over. 
You know, when uh, Joyce was trying to find out who was giving him the money, and he wrote to her solicitors, uh, they wrote on her behalf, but I'm sure in her words, to say that what she, his client admired was, I, I think, um, the scorching truth of his work. With his new affluence, Joyce soon became well known in the restaurants and cafes of Zurich, where he liked to drink Swiss white wine and meet people of all nationalities. It was here he met Frank Budgeon, an English painter, with whom he discussed the enormous difficulties to be overcome in writing Ulysses. I write with such difficulty, so slowly. Chance furnishes me what I need. I am like a man who stumbles along. My foot strikes something, I bend over, and it is exactly what I want. Joyce was putting everything into Ulysses, utterly obsessed by the task. At times, Nora had to put her foot down. I go to bed, and then that man sits in the next room and continues laughing about his own writing. And then I knock at the door and I say, now, Jim, stop writing or stop laughing. He enjoyed the sheer difficulty of writing such a book, of reconstructing Dublin exactly as it had been in June 1904. In far off Zurich, Joyce still held the city in his mind. Ulysses teems with the life and language of the people he had known and with the shops and streets of the city that was vivid in his memory. He insisted on absolute accuracy, consulting maps and directories, sending pestering letters to friends in Dublin for detailed information, using a stopwatch to keep the movements of his characters within the bounds of strict possibility. But Joyce, like Homer, was about to suffer for his work on Ulysses. The physical strain of writing was damaging his eyes, his daughter Lucia saw him in tears when he could not read his own words, and his sister Eileen remembered him trying to protect his threatened sight. He wrote at night mostly, mostly at night, and he lay always across the bed on his stomach when he wrote with a huge blue pencil, a huge blue pencil, like a carpenter's pencil, and a white coat on him to reflect on the paper, you see to give reflection because his sight was so bad. He always wrote with a white coat on him to give a kind of a white light. The pain became so excruciating that Joyce agreed to undergo an operation which, though relatively successful, reduced the vision of one eye. He had about a dozen operations over the next 20 years in an attempt to save as much of his vision as he could. More harrowing than physical pain, was the fear that he would be unable to complete Ulysses. The early chapters, which appeared in an American magazine, The Little Review, had been received with rapture. As the book progressed, Joyce's methods became necessarily more outrageous in terms of conventional narrative. Some disciples began to have doubts, but Joyce carried on, well aware that what he was doing needed to be done, and hopeful that one day it would all seem justified. When war ended, Joyce felt that he should leave Zurich and return to Trieste. When he did so in 1919, Trieste proved to be a much duller city under the Italians than it had been under the Austro-Hungarian Empire. His brother Stanislaus had his own circle of friends and was not so eager to be confided in, even if Joyce had wanted to do that. It was clear that he could not remain for long in this city. Trieste was a backward step. Not a soul to talk to about Bloom. Lend two chapters to one or two people, but they know as much about it as the parliamentary side of my arse. My brother knows something, but he thinks it a joke. Oh, shite and onions. When is this bloody state of affairs going to end? At Ezra Pound's invitation, Joyce decided to spend a few days in Paris. He stayed for 20 years.
Between the two wars, Paris was the home of the avant-garde. Well, I think, you know, uh, Paris in the, this time, uh, the 20s, was the capital of arts in the world. It was something, everybody came to Paris because it was really the center of the, well, the spirit and the arts and culture. And uh, I suppose uh, it was uh, uh, the best town where uh, Joyce could found his uh, liberty. Paris between the wars was an extremely cheap place to live well. And that explains why so many foreigners and artists in particular, whether they were painters or writers, sculptors or what have you, could manage uh, to live fairly well on even as little as $50 a month. Very quickly, Joyce became the most famous, the most daring, the most mysterious writer of them all. Certainly, Joyce was a man who was very conscious and sure about his genius. I am convinced of it. He knew it perfectly, but he didn't boast about it. Joyce had an extraordinary ability to gather disciples, people who could help him fulfill his mission. Soon after his arrival in Paris, he met a young American woman, Sylvia Beach who had recently opened a bookstore with the unlikely name of Shakespeare and Company. She had heard of him and was eager to help him. With the aid of her friend, Adrien Monnier, whose shop was across the street from hers on the Rue de Lodion, she did everything in her power to facilitate the publishing of Ulysses. And then Joyce, who had uh, begun by being a member of my library, and he, taking out Riders to the Sea, that was the first book he borrowed, he uh, began to frequent the bookshop like all these other people who had adopted it as their headquarters. And uh, Hemingway and all the young writers used to practically live in my bookshop. I could hardly get any work done. Ulysses was placed in the hands of Valérie Labeau, the most eminent critic of international literature in France. He was enraptured declared that it was a comic masterpiece and promised to do everything possible to bring it to the public. But there were others who sought to protect the public from this terrible book with its crude language and explicit descriptions of bodily functions. The United States Post Office seized and burned numbers of the Little Review, which included episodes of Ulysses. Well, I, he used to tell me about what was going on in New York and he was following this case where the uh, Ulysses was being suppressed. And finally he came one day to show me this little review. And he said, you see, this is now being completely suppressed. And my book, as he pronounced it, will never come out. So he sat there with his head in his hands. And uh, I uh, said to him, would you like me to publish Ulysses? And he said, I would. <laughs> he was very, seemed very much relieved, in fact. Why, I don't know, because it wouldn't inspire confidence in anyone who had such a book that he'd taken seven years to write, to give it to, into the hands of someone so inexperienced and young and uh, just a kind of a little bookshop, not a publishing house at all. In retrospect, the production of the book seems almost miraculous, but it was largely due to the efforts of three women. Sylvia Beach, Adrienne Manier, and Harriet Weaver. As Joyce labored away to finish the book, these three guardian angels drummed up as much excitement and money as possible. Subscriptions were called for. Yeats, Churchill, and many other people sent theirs in, but one Dublin writer declined. I have read several fragments of Ulysses. It is a revolting record of a disgusting phase of civilization. But it is a truthful one. Faithfully, George Bernard Shaw. Joyce looked forward to the publication of his book, but was intensely superstitious. Some omens were fearful. He wanted the book to be published on his 40th birthday, February the 2nd, 1922. 
there was tremendous pressure on Sylvia Beach to coax the printer into managing this. And at last she did so. On the morning of February the 2nd, two advance copies were collected. One was given to Joyce and the other exhibited in Sylvia Beach's shop window. In the midst of all the praise and celebration, Joyce seemed strangely subdued, as if he were sorry to lose the task by which he had been so exhausted. When he later presented a copy to Nora, she offered to sell it. Joyce eyed her with displeasure. She was loyal and loving, but she had never known and never would know of what his literary greatness consisted. His setting of the book on the day of their first date was a gesture she could appreciate nonetheless. Because of Joyce's revolutionary style and technique, readers of Ulysses were coming to know Mr. Leopold Bloom as intimately as they knew themselves. Always see a fellow's weak point in his wife. Still, there's destiny in it, falling in love, have their own secrets between them. Chaps that would go to the dogs if some woman didn't take them in hand. And then, little chits of girls, height of a shilling in coppers, with little hubbies. As God made them, he matched them. Didn't look back when she was going down the strand. Wouldn't give that satisfaction. Those girls, those girls, those lovely seaside girls. Fine eyes she had, clear. It's the white of the eye brings her out, not so much the pupil. Did she know what I... Of course. Like a cat sitting beyond the dog's jump. Never see them sit on a bench marked wet paint. Always with the last, those girls. Those girls, those lovely seaside girls, all dimple smiles and curls, your head it simply whirls. They look all right, complexions pink and white, they've diamond rings and dainty feet, golden hair from reed and street. Light is a kind of reassuring, not going to hurt you. Some light still. Red rays are longest. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. Where those night clouds there all the time? Looks like a phantom ship. No, wait. Trees are there. An optical illusion. Mirage. Land of the setting sun, this. Home rule sun setting in the southeast. My native land. Good night. We know more or less what Mr. Bloom looked like because Joyce drew this caricature of him. Readers often wonder if Bloom was based on a living person. Some feel that Joyce's model was this man, Ettore Schmitz, who wrote under the name of Italo Suevo. He was a Triestine Jewish novelist whose family befriended the Joyces. Schmitz financed at least one of Joyce's trips to Ireland and received a strange postcard from that country when Joyce was visiting Nora's home in Galway. Mr. Bloom in Ulysses is not my father, but it is a part of my father and a part of other Jewish persons of Trieste. But uh, when he spoke with my father and had Ulysses in his mind, he asked very often, Mr. Schmitz, what would you as Jew answer to this and this. And he asked him so often that my father was really afraid of this asking. And he said to Stanislaus Joyce, well, he asked me too much about Jewish. I will tell, ask him, what would you answer as an Irishman? Ulysses was printed in the Greek colors, white letters on a blue cover. Joyce had a tie made to match the occasion. A small influential group understood his literary achievement. T.S. Eliot. I hold this book to be the most important expression which the present day has found. W.B. Yeats. 
He has certainly surpassed in intensity any novelist of our time. Ernest Hemingway was overwhelmed. Joyce has a most goddamn wonderful book. Joyce was glad to have their praise, but was more interested in the views of his own family. None of them said what he hoped. His father was slightly surprised, but not shocked. <laughs> He's a nice sort of blagad. Joyce's Aunt Josephine Murray, his regular correspondent, was deeply shocked. Well, at the height of his fame, he comes to London to his publishers, um, and he never neglected to ring up the hospital where my two sisters were nurses and take them out to dinner. And just before this, he had prepared and he sent Mother the book of Ulysses, signed to Aunt Josephine from Jim, 20, 1922. So, uh, he said then, he turned to Alice, and of course he was full of uh, joy and everything as his success, and he said, what did Aunt Josephine think of my book? And Alice said, she never read it. Well, there was a blank silence, I think. She what? She never read it. Why? Did you read it? No, she wouldn't give let us read it. Why not? Because she didn't think it was fit to be read. Well, then, if my book is not fit to be read, life isn't fit to live. Many readers felt uneasy at Joyce's depiction of Molly Bloom. Bloom's wife and her lover, Blazes Boylan. In the long monologue of Molly at the end, she recalls her erotic history. Joyce made it difficult for readers to be squeamish or for writers after him to be prudish. Buxom, ample, exuberant and imperfect, Molly is typical of the world of Ulysses and she is given the last welcoming word. Yes. And how he kissed me under the Moorish wall, and I thought, well, as well, him as another. And then I asked him with my eyes to ask again, yes. And then he asked me, would I, yes, to say yes, my mountain flower. At first I put my arms around him, yes, and drew him down to me so he could feel my breasts all perfume, yes. And his heart was going like mad, and yes, I said, yes, I will, yes. Joyce became a legend in his own time. He refused all interviews. His silence was taken by some to be a subtle device to attract more attention. But he didn't want to answer questions about his work. He didn't forget those who helped him most. Harriet Weaver was given copy number one of Ulysses. It was Joyce's way of acknowledging her literary and financial backing. Up to 1924, uh, and from 1917, she gave him just over £21,000. And I've had a sum done to find out how much that would uh, mean now, and it's just about a quarter of a million, quarter of a million pounds. The amazement generated by the writing in Ulysses made Joyce the focus of international attention and adulation. Scott Fitzgerald drew this cartoon as a comic tribute to the new master. André Gide, James Stevens, Frank O'Connor, Paul Valéry, T.S. Eliot, Ezra Pound, Ford Maddox Ford and many others arrived to pay their respects. A devoted family man, Joyce was now an object of public curiosity. And they used to uh, uh, besiege him at this restaurant. He was never allowed any peace at the restaurant that he went to opposite the Gare Montparnasse because they used to come there and bring a book for him to sign. And people used to come and sit at crowd the tables just to look at him while he was having his dinner, which was very disturbing for the poor Joyce family, the whole family. <laughs> when Miss Weaver was coming, he, uh, he, he became more extravagant than usual when she was there. He wouldn't take, she would take buses, but he would always take taxis. And he would always go to Fouquet's. Among his favorite restaurants was Fouquet's on the Champs-Élysées, where he used to dine fairly regularly in the late 1920s and 1930s, drinking white wine. 
and eating little, always tipping lavishly. The head porter, Ossia Beaugrand, was a bellboy at Fouquet's in the 1920s. Today he remembers the Irish writer. Oui, c'est lunette. Oh, yes, the man with the glasses. He wore very thick glasses. He could see very little. He could hardly see at all. Oh, he was very nice, a very nice man. They treated him uh, like royalty. First of all, he tipped like royalty. I don't know how royalty tips, but he would take out a hundred franc note, which at that time really had some meaning and hand it around uh, as being perfectly normal. The Joyce family was nomadic, moving from Trieste to Zurich, back to Trieste and on to Paris. It was difficult for the children to cope with the changes from their native Italian to German and later to French. Joyce seldom stayed for long in the same city, let alone in the same flat. His biographer, Richard Ellman, has calculated that Joyce had more than 200 addresses throughout his life. His children, Giorgio and Lucia, were spun around like bewildered satellites, unable to see themselves except in relation to their strange, renowned father. A serious problem arose when Lucia, in her early 20s, began to show signs of mental disturbance. Joyce was most reluctant to believe that anything was wrong with her. He thought her illness was related to his own extremism of creation. Whatever spark or gift I possess has been transmitted to Lucia and has kindled a fire in her. And as you know, she suffered from schizophrenia and uh, there was nothing else that you could say that. She never went to bed, ne never slept at all and she was always sleeping outside and on the, on the seat in the garden and the police would come along and knock on our door and say Lucia is out again and we'll have to take her in and the weather didn't upset her at all but uh, and of course she was funny as well you know I mean she was full of life and always singing, always singing in all the different languages that she knew. Joyce did everything he could for her, short of abandoning his own work. He encouraged her as a dancer. Later, he encouraged her efforts to illustrate books. He took her from specialist to specialist, spending most of his income on her. I think the, the story of Lucia was Really, the, 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 the most awful for him, because uh, he liked very much, and she liked naturally very much, his uh, father. And that was, I think it was broken. Lucia's illness was a cross he would have to bear for the remainder of his life. He had some friends and many admirers. But as he said to a particularly close friend, Beckett, I don't love anyone except my family. There was only his family and his work. Even when it seemed that his work would be at the expense of his family, he carried on. Though he was almost blind, physically weak and under appalling psychological strain, he was now launched on a book which would be so outrageously adventurous that it would make Ulysses seem simple. It was a book on which you would spend 17 years working out a universal comedy suggested by a music hall ballad he had first heard as a boy in Bray. But she met the sort of a Kipling way with the love of the liquor he was born and to help him on with his work each day he did drop of the crater every morn White for the dad and stole your partner went the floor you trot to shake Wasn't it the truth I told you lots of fun at Finnegan's Wake? Him 
Finnegan lived and walked and street, a gentleman Irish, my dear. He had the tongue both rich and sweet, and the rise in the world he carried a heart. A chim and the salt of a chiplin way, with the love of the liquor he was born. And to help him on with his work each day, he did drop of the crater every morn. Quite full of dad and stole your father, went the floor, you trapped a shake. Wasn't it the truth I told Ulysses you? Ulysses had been the book of one way. Dublin day. Finnegan's Wake was the book of the night set in the village of Chapel Lizard on the banks of the River Liffey. It is a dream book which brings the reader into the subconscious of the sleeping narrator. The characters of the dream are fluid and unfixed. We encounter the publican, Humphrey Chimpton Earwicker. He is related to Finn McCool, an ancient Irish epic hero whose body is supposed to lie from Hoth, where his head is, to the Phoenix Park where his feet are. He is married to Anna Livia Pluribel, who is in some sense the River Liffey, and all rivers, all wives, all mothers. Their sons are Shem and Sean, artist and priest, all conflicting brothers and principals. Their daughter is Isabel, who seems to be every man's desire. The story of this family becomes that of the world as well as the Chapel Lizard Earwickers. To communicate what he wanted, Joyce made another great stylistic innovation. He invaded the unconscious of his race where language is formed, partly by splitting familiar words, but also by borrowing words from other languages. Joyce evolved a language which, though based on English with a strong Irish accent, was a mixture of the many languages he knew. This is Joyce's own reading of one passage. Ah, oh, but she was the queer old skeosh anyhow, and Olivia Trinket toes. And sure he was the queer old bunts too. Dear dirty dumpling, who's their father of Fingals and Dothergills? Gaffer and Gammer were all their gangsters. Hadn't he seven dams to wife him? And every dam had her seven crutches, and every crutch had its seven hues, and each hue had a differing cry. Suds for me and supper for you, and the doctor's bill for George on. The first reaction of readers was predictable, complete bafflement. Some suspected a hoax. Others wondered if the writing of Ulysses had softened Joyce's brain. Stanislaus was in no doubt as to what was happening. It seemed to me that the indispensable controls which had held so firmly before the war failed to act in the French capital, where he was surrounded by a too admiring group and where the deference to originality tends to run to a cult of the eccentric. Finnegan's Wake was never discussed with my father, and when my father saw the first edition of it, he was quite appalled. He felt that there was a certain attitude of contempt on the part of the artist towards the public. He wasn't trying to communicate. He was deliberately using a very difficult language. Even Miss Weaver, who had applauded Joyce's experiments in Ulysses, was appalled by his latest efforts. She really couldn't take it. And gradually this, of course, became apparent to, to Mr. Joyce too, over the, over the years in the 20s. And it, it, was, it was a terrible thing for them both, because I think from his point of view, the fact that she admired his work made the money that she gave him a symbol of her approval of his work. And when she could no longer improve, approve what she, he was doing, then uh, the money took on a completely different colour. Joyce was badly shaken by these criticisms, drained by his concern for Lucia and increasingly isolated by poor sight, he came close to breakdown. There were some who remained steadfast in their support of Joyce and who tried to prepare the public for his new book. Among them was Samuel Beckett, a fellow Dubliner, who was later to become famous himself as a literary innovator. Beckett was a strange young man, but Joyce admired his enigmatic mind and valued his assistance. With Beckett, Joyce engaged in quiet conversations which were interrupted by long silences. 
he tended to be less guarded with Beckett than he was with other artists and intellectuals. The key figure in Joyce's support group was Paul Leon, a Russian Jew who had come to live in Paris. He was an intellectual emigre who had written on law and literature. I have been working with Joyce. The name probably means nothing to you, but it is that of the great, the greatest writer of our time. And yet, he is writing in a way that nobody understands, or can understand. Every afternoon at two o'clock, Joyce left his apartment at number two square Robiac, walked along the Rue de Grenelle in the direction of Rue Casimir Perrier. Here was Paul Leon's apartment, Joyce's literary headquarters throughout the 1930s. Yes, this is the living room today, dining room, salon, what have you. But in those days, and I'm talking now about the 30s, when I was only about 12 or 13, it was a room, and this is the table, in which there were a lot of work was done. Mr. Joyce, I remember, used to sit there, my father there, Philippe Soupeau there, Eugene Jolas there, I believe, Mr. Beckett, when he came, was there, and there were others too. Ulysses was already out, of course, but they were working on the translation into French of Anne Olivia Pluribel, the fragment of Finnegan's Wake that is mostly about Dublin. Here are some galley proofs. I notice my father's handwriting. Mr. Joyce would direct the corrections and these are in my father's hand. Here we have a painting that my parents liked very much. Below a photograph of Mr. Joyce taken for a cover of a news magazine in the 30s. There, a photograph of Mr. Joyce and my father. Leon put himself at Joyce's service. He asked for no payment other than the honor of assisting. As I look back, I think they were perhaps complementary personalities. On the physical side, I must tell you the anecdote of uh, Philippe Soupeau running into them. I think it was on the Rue Royale, you know, between Concord and Madeleine. And uh, my father w walked rather stooped, you know. He worked uh, long hours on his uh, writing table, writing, and uh, he was a bit stoop-shouldered. Mr. Joyce couldn't see very well, that's to say the least. And so they would walk, you know, arm in arm, uh, slowly around Paris, and uh, when Philippe Soupo saw them, he said, Ah, l'aveugle et le paralytique. The lame leading the blind, one could say. And so just as they were complementary in the physical sense, in their deambulations around Paris, so they were in their, well, perhaps one could call it a literary relationship. Uh, my father very often read uh, to Mr. Joyce not only uh, works of uh, other writers that Mr. Joyce liked to hear and discussed with him afterwards, such as uh, some of the Russian writers of the 19th century, but also there was the whole question of galley proofs and reading uh, the text that uh, the manuscripts, the typescripts that uh, came from the publishers. These were particularly difficult for the last work, which was not written in uh, Queen's English, uh, Finnegan's Wake, and therefore there were uh, many, many corrections, and that meant spelling out as it was written, since Mr. Joyce couldn't very well read because of his eyes. Like Mr. Bloom, Joyce was essentially a family man. Despite his customary carelessness about money and his earlier objections to formalized matrimony, he married Nora during a visit to London in 1931 to ensure that she and the children could inherit his estate. Though they lived among people who scorned conventional morality, Joyce and Nora remained faithful in an old-fashioned way. Well, she told me that she didn't know whether he was a genius or not. And every now and then she, uh, she would say, well, why don't we just put him behind bars and feed him peanuts? <laughs> But she said, quite seriously, I do know that he's unique. And that, I think, was a great compliment from her, you know. James Joyce of Paris was very different from the struggling writer whose late-night roistering 
had shocked the solid citizens of Trieste and Zurich. Although the language of Ulysses had terrified the moral guardians of two continents, the author of Ulysses would not tolerate any obscenity in conversation and was notoriously prudish in the company of women. For the loyal troops of the avant-garde, Joyce was in many ways a disappointing leader. He disliked literary discussions. He preferred the cinema, the radio, the newspaper, and old-fashioned opera. And the courageous champion of freedom of expression was a profoundly superstitious person. He was. I remember one year we were going away for a fairly long time. It was in summer. And uh, we went to say goodbye to them. And as we were going away, entering our voiture, we heard the window of their flat opened and Joyce bending over the street, shouting, don't go away tomorrow, it is Friday 13. <laughs> Joyce was off-putting until one got to know him. He seemed indrawn, fastidious, and preoccupied with his work. Only when the situation was convivial did he relax. Mozart arias, Moore's melodies, and the songs of the music hall were always sung when the Joyce family entertained. People would then discover how friendly and entertaining he could be. They always gave parties at that time for uh, their friends, for writers who were in Paris. I remember a few of those uh, writers, but I've forgotten most. They were Macamon, Rodker, Ford Maddoxford, of course, the Mara and Eugène Jolas, and the Leon. And it was a very cheerful party, always. At the end, Joyce always sang. I have been told that in the most recent biography of Beckett, that he says that when Joyce and Mariah Jola started squalling after dinner, I left, or something to that effect. Anyway, he, he speaks of our caterwauling or something like that. Anyway, we thought we were singing. <laughs> we didn't think it was caterwauling. And we sang, we, we knew, we realized that we knew a whole lot of the same songs, you see. And Joyce had this lovely tenor voice, and of course my, my voice is uh, mezzo-soprano, and, and uh, so we had a lot of fun singing. Giorgio sang, and very, <clears throat> Giorgio had a beautiful voice, you know, a remarkable bass voice. <laughs> Well, we sang. Uh, shall I sing it for you? <laughs> Just a song at twilight When the lights are low And the trembling shadows Softly come and go and Though the heart be weary Sad the day To us at twilight comes love's old song, comes love's old sweet song. 
and I hear Joyce's tenor voice, you see, singing above me. Joyce cultivated the idea of himself as an exile. Though he refused several invitations to return to Ireland, he could and often did claim that in a sense he had never left it. He lived in his writings, and the world of his writings was always Ireland. Well, really, I'll tell you what I think. I think it was when I came from Dublin. He was always interested when anybody came from Dublin. And if you ask them, will you see anybody, he always the same question, do they come from Dublin? And if they did, he would see them. But otherwise, if they didn't come from Dublin, he wasn't interested. Um, for instance, uh, the last time I saw him in his partially furnished flat in the Rue de Vin, there's a rug on the floor, and I was looking at the rug, and he saw me looking at the rug. And, can, you, can you make out the pattern, he said? No, I said no. That's the Liffey from its source to its mouth, given to me by an American. And then it had more than any of my countrymen have ever done for me. Well, he no doubt considered for a long time that he was in exile from Ireland, a voluntary exile, as he put it. He rather liked the idea that while Dante was a forced exile, he himself was a voluntary exile. But then, as we know, he kept coming back he kept uh, circling back to look in through the window of the place that he had left. In the end, he could not leave Ireland alone. He was um, Irish. Uh, he was anti-Irish in an Irish way. Uh, I think he definitely does belong <laughs> to his own country. In the same way, he maintained a strange relationship with the Catholic Church. He neither confessed nor took communion. He was often derogatory. Yet he was anxious that his books should not commit propaganda, even against the institutions of which he disapproved. Joyce's rejection of the church was compatible, however, with considerable interest in it and in its ceremonies. Because there's one thing you, that you have to realize about Joyce, and that is to say, he turned against the church. He left the church. He vilified it. But he remained a profoundly Christian man. And he, as, as uh, I, I know, uh, Alexis knows too that I'm not inventing, I think that uh, Paul went very often with him, supposedly, you might say, on, on a sort of... Uh, an expedition uh, to see how they were doing it now. In December 1931, news came from Dublin that his father had died at the age of 82. Joyce was so overwhelmed with grief and guilt that he even thought of abandoning his work. For years he had longed to visit his father and had led him to believe that he would go to Dublin. But some instinct had held him back. Now it was too late. Pappy was dead. Hundreds of pages and scores of characters in my books came from him. I got from him portraits, a waistcoat, a good tenor voice, and an extravagant, licentious disposition. Joyce's pain was eased when Giorgio presented him with a grandson. He expressed his sense of the ebb and flow of human life in his finest poem, Ecce Pua. Of the dark past a boy is born, with joy and grief my heart is torn. Calm in his cradle the living lies, may love and mercy unclose his eyes. Young life is breathed on the glass, a world that was not comes to pass. A child is sleeping, an old man gone. O oh, father forsaken, forgive your son. The baby boy was called Stephen James Joyce. He was pleased to be able to have a photograph taken of his father, himself, his son and his grandson. And uh, this uh, photograph was taken in uh, the villa we lived in on the Rue Chefer in Paris. 
I would say around 1936. But to him it meant that uh, he had four generations gathered together. Joyce was fast becoming an old and harrowed man. All around him was disintegration. Giorgio's marriage was breaking up. But cruelest of all was the accelerating destruction of Lucia's sanity. Eventually, even Joyce accepted that his beloved daughter would have to be put in a sanatorium. And uh, he, he never lost contact, and he, he went to see her for every Sunday afternoon, and I remember his coming back one night to Phuket's and telling us about the situation, and he, he said, and I'm supposed to be writing a funny book. With the help of his friends, the awesome task of checking the proofs of his new book was completed. And at Joyce's 58th birthday party, the centerpiece was an advanced copy of Finnegan's Wake. The year was 1939, and once again the world had other things to think about. He was, he, he knew the war was coming, he had no doubts whatever about it. But all the French were saying, ah, oh, pas de guerre, jamais de guerre, but not him. The First World War had exploded just when he had wanted people to read a portrait of the artist. During that war, he had worked on Ulysses, a book which celebrated generosity of spirit and mocked the men of violence. It seemed that Finnegan's Wake, the work of 17 years, would be lost in yet another explosion of human greed and cruelty. <laughs> Furieux. I said, why? He said, that's just a stupid thing, that war, just for the beginning of uh, my book is going out, and now with that war, uh, people will not read him. That was the only one fact in the war that was uh, wrong for, for him. <laughs> now Joyce was more alone than ever, on the verge of giving up and passing out like Anna Livia at the end of Finnegan's Wake. I done me best when I was left, thinking always as I go, all goes, a hundred cares, a tithe of troubles, and is there one who understands me, one in a thousand of years of the nights. All me life I have been lived among them, but now they are becoming loath to me. You're only a bumpkin, I thought you were great in all things, in guilt and in glory. You're but a puny. Home. But I'm loathing them that's here, and all I loathe. Lonely in me loneliness. For all their faults, I am passing out. Oh, bitter ending. I'll slip away before they're up. I'll never see, nor know, nor miss me. Joyce admitted to feeling exhausted, but in fact he was dying. The truth was captured by the camera of Giselle Freund when she took photographs of Joyce for a Time magazine cover in May 1939. And when I photographed him, he didn't say a word. He, he cited that, you see, like some, uh, somebody who, who doesn't feel well. And he told me, by the way, uh, Oh, this is my last book, and, and now all that is left is to, for me is to die. And uh, he was then, I think, 58 or 57. And I said, Mr. Joyce, the youngest man of the French Academy is in the 60s, so why should you think about this and so on? And um, I think he was very, uh, very, very exhausted. But I might uh, think it might have been also the little white wine he liked so much, you know? 
I, I have one picture which I never show him because it's too uh, triste. This is the face in front where you see him, uh, a fuss because he looked so uh, triste, sad, sad, so sad, and so exhausted that I never dared to show him. As he's seen every other picture, but this I never dared to show him. And this was a very good psychological picture. I think this was the best picture I did of him. As German forces occupied France, Joyce, who had always seen himself as something of a wandering Jew, was on the move again. We, uh, it was the last time I saw him, and it was in uh, that little village called saint gerand le puy very near Vichy, where he had fled from Paris with, uh, with Murat Jolas. And late in the night, late during the night, I uh, said to him, I remember that very well. What are you doing at present, Mr. Joyce? And uh, he said to me, well, adding comas to Finnegan's wake, which meant naturally that he was doing nothing at all. Then I went on uh, after a while and I said to him, uh, will you, are you, are you, uh, you're working on nothing new? Uh, and he said, no. Then there was silence again, and uh, chuckled, sighed, and, uh, well, I think that if ever I write something else, it will, be, it will be very, 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 very simple. And it's old and old, it's sad and old, it's sad and weary, I go back to you, my cold father, my cold mad father, my cold mad feely father. Yes, carry me along, Taddy, like you done through the toy fair. Gulls, far calls, coming far and hear us then, Finn, again, take, but softly, memor me, away, alone, a lost, a loved, along the... River run, past Eve and Adams, from swerve of shore to bend of bay, brings us, by a commodious vicus of recirculation, back to Hoth Castle, and environs. He was tired and drinking heavily. The fate of Lucia haunted him. Paul Leon was arrested by the Germans and later killed as a Jew. Joyce refused to fly to America, preferring to seek once again the safety of Switzerland. In Zurich, he spent his time quietly, walking with his grandson, Stephen. Well, the city of Zurich, of course, all through his life and the family's life, was always a refuge and a haven. Uh, in the First World War, uh, Nono, Nonna, my father and Aunt Lucia fled to Zurich from Trieste and they spent the whole war here. And uh, during the Second World War, we again fled to Zurich, but um, the second time there was only Nono, Nonna, my father and myself, because Aunt Lucia was in hospital and we couldn't get her out of France. So in a sense, I think uh, Zurich was a haven, a refuge. The family has always been exiles and uh, this was a place where they came to when there was trouble. But I do remember very uh, distinctly that he was tired and worn. And we hoped that uh, when he came here, and in a sense, our major troubles were over, he would tell us what was wrong. In January 1941, he had an attack of stomach cramps. When morphine didn't alleviate the pain, he was taken to hospital where it was discovered that he had a perforated ulcer. James Joyce died on January the 13th and was buried two days later as the snow fell on Funtern Cemetery.
When asked to comment for this program on the centenary of Joyce's birth, Samuel Beckett had this to say. I express yet again my debt to this great man and enduring wonder before his achievement. Professor Richard Ellman is the biographer and acknowledged authority on Joyce. But he himself hoped, I think, that he was doing something as important as had been done by other great writers uh, of the past. Uh, I don't think he compared himself to Homer completely or to Dante completely, but I think he thought that he was dealing with um, certain aspects of experience in as radical a way as those writers had done. Joyce's reputation seems to be increasing, if anything. I suspect he is a permanent fixture, that in the future we will think of him as, as a, a, a principal pillar of English literature. Nora Joyce died in 1951 and is buried in Zurich. Their son Giorgio died in 1976. Lucia Joyce is 75 years of age. Since 1936, she has lived in an English hospital which has an outstanding reputation for caring for patients with their affliction, schizophrenia. Her condition has improved somewhat in recent years. She still speaks four languages and sings all the songs she sang with her parents, whom she remembers with great affection. Today, James Joyce is still the focus of worldwide literary attention. He anticipated this and even encouraged it. The ingenuity with which he wrote his books was the same with which he forced the world to read them. If you're asking me what he would think of all this, I think I can give you a very clear and unequivocal answer. On this day of the 2nd of February, 1982, when the world will celebrate his centennial, wherever he is, he will be smiling. The man who died in Zurich on the 13th of January, 1941, had traveled a great distance from the boy in Rathgar. Yet Joyce held firm throughout. His books would be Irish. He would lay bare Dublin life. He would imply what a new Ireland might be like. With Dubliners, he had displayed the effect of repression. With a portrait, he had represented the growth of the artist as a victory over that repression. In Ulysses, he elaborated this victory in portraying a Dublin day. And in Finnegan's Wake, he offered intimations of humanity, attuned to nature, and exalted in song, all in terms of a Dublin night. For all this, we can only thank him as we go about our business in an imperfect world, which he seems to have understood better than it understood him. <laughs>